Hello, this is Andy from the Engineers Academy and in this video we're going to be discussing some of the relationships between elastic constants. And by elastic constants what we mean are some of the properties of various different materials, things such as elasticity, rigidity and so on. So we're going to begin by looking at each of the elastic constants and then we're going to look at how they're defined and then we're going to move on to look at some of the equations that are actually used to connect these elastic constants together. So there are a number of elastic constants and some of these you may already be familiar with. We have the elastic modulus which is represented by the letter E and that's also commonly referred to as Young's modulus. We have the modulus of rigidity, G. We have something called the bulk modulus, K. And we also have something called the Poisson's ratio, which is represented by the Greek letter nu. So let's take each of those in turn and begin to get a better understanding of what each of those constants represent. So firstly, we have the elastic modulus. And what we're referring to here is a material's resistance to elastic deformation when a direct stress is applied. Now there's a small diagram in the left hand corner showing what we mean by a direct stress or direct loading. And it's basically when either a tensile or a compressive force is being applied to a piece of material. Now when we refer to elastic deformation, what we're basically referring to is reversible deformation. So if you stretch a piece of material and you don't stretch it past its yield point, when you let go, it's going to return to its original length. Now there's a common equation for this, elastic modulus E equals stress over strain. And the stress is the force that's being applied divided by the cross-sectional area of the material, whereas the strain is the change in length divided by the original length. What that means is that the stress on the top of the equation is a product of the force that's being applied, and the strain on the bottom of the equation relates to how much the test piece is deforming. If we rearrange that equation then to make strain the subject, or deformation, we have strain equals stress over elastic modulus. Now what we can see by doing that is that a high elastic modulus corresponds with less elastic deformation. Materials with a greater elastic modulus will exhibit less elastic deformation when direct stresses are applied. So next then, we have our modulus of rigidity. Now the modulus of rigidity is a material's resistance to elastic deformation, except this time it's when a shearing stress is applied. Now once again in the bottom left hand corner we have a diagram to demonstrate what we mean by shearing or a shearing action. And essentially what we're doing is we're taking the top surface in one direction and the bottom surface in another direction. It's causing the object to skew or shear. Now the equation that's used for modulus of rigidity states that modulus of rigidity is shear stress over shear strain. Now once again we know that shear stress is a product of the forces that are being applied and the shear strain relates to the deformation. So once again we can rearrange that to make shear strain the subject and we have shear strain equals shear stress over modulus of rigidity. Now once again by doing that what we can see is that a high modulus of rigidity corresponds with less elastic deformation. So once again, materials with a higher modulus of rigidity are going to exhibit less elastic deformation when these shear forces are applied. Another way of applying a shear force is by applying a torque or a torsional force to an object. And we would typically see this on drive shafts. So high modulus of rigidity, higher resistance to elastic deformation. The next of our elastic constants then is our bulk modulus. And bulk modulus is a material's resistance to deformation when uniform pressure is applied to all surfaces. We have a small diagram in the top right hand corner to demonstrate this. So if an object has a uniform pressure being applied to all of its surface or surrounding it, then the bulk modulus tells us how much that object is going to deform by. Now once again we have a formula to represent this. We have bulk modulus equals minus pressure divided by volumetric strain. So once again, to better understand what the bulk modulus actually tells us about the material, we can rearrange that equation to make volumetric strain the subject, and we get volumetric strain equals minus pressure over the bulk modulus. The reason we have a minus sign here is because if the pressure is positive, so if a pressure is being applied to the outside of an object, then the volume of that object is going to decrease. Therefore, if the pressure is positive, the volumetric strain is going to be negative and vice versa. 
But by rearranging this equation, what we can tell is that a high bulk modulus corresponds with less deformation once again. Because if uniform pressure is applied and we're dividing by the bulk modulus of the material, the higher the bulk modulus, the lower the volumetric strain. And a lower volumetric strain basically means less deformation. Okay, so let's look at the final elastic constant of interest, and this is our Poisson's ratio. Now, the Poisson's ratio is a material's relative resistance to deformation in directions perpendicular to the direction of loading. Now, once again, I've included a diagram to help to describe this. What we see in the top right-hand corner is we have an axial load being applied to our object, or a tensile load. Now, as we know, if we stretch a material, in the horizontal direction, it's going to experience a narrowing in the vertical direction, and that's been indicated by our dashed lines there. The narrowing is going to be a proportion of the lengthening, if you like. But more accurately what's happening here is when we place a strain in the horizontal direction, we're going to get an induced strain in the y direction. So we have an equation that links these things together. The Poisson's ratio is minus the induced strain divided by the direct strain. So in effect, it's a ratio between the induced strain, shown on our diagram in the vertical direction by the dashed arrows, divided by the direct strain, which is the strain caused by the tensile force in the horizontal plane. By rearranging that equation to make induced strain the subject, we get induced strain equals minus the Poisson's ratio times the direct strain. Now once again, the reason it's negative is because if our direct strain is causing the object to stretch or elongate, then the induced strain is going to be causing the object to narrow. Therefore, a positive direct strain leads to a negative induced strain. And the Poisson's ratio tells us the ratio with which the elongation in the x direction compares to the narrowing in the y direction. Now we have a summarising statement at the bottom there. A high Poisson's ratio corresponds with more relative deformation in directions perpendicular to the applied load. So in this case, if the Poisson's ratio is higher, then we see a greater narrowing of that piece of material. We can tell that from the equation because the induced strain is going to be larger whenever our Poisson's ratio is larger, or it's going to be a larger proportion of the direct strain to be more accurate. Okay. So next, we need to consider how these elastic constants are connected. And there's a range of useful equations that we can use in order to determine each of these elastic constants when only two of these constants are known. So on the screen here, we have a number of equations. And in the next video, we're going to see how we actually can apply these equations to determine our elastic constants. At the top, we have a number of equations for the elastic modulus or the Young's modulus. We have one equation here where we can calculate the elastic modulus when the modulus of rigidity and the Poisson's ratio are known. We have another equation here where we can calculate the elastic modulus when the bulk modulus and the Poisson's ratio are known. Conversely, we could use either of these equations if the elastic modulus and one other elastic constant were known, and we were trying to find the remaining constant. So for example, if elastic modulus and bulk modulus were known, we could rearrange this equation in order to find our Poisson's ratio. We have equations for determining the modulus of rigidity when the elastic modulus and the Poisson's ratio are known. And we have equations for calculating the bulk modulus when the elastic modulus and the Poisson's ratio are known. And finally, we have an equation for calculating Poisson's ratio when the elastic modulus isn't known, but our bulk modulus and our modulus of rigidity are known. So providing we know two of these elastic constants, we can use a combination of these equations in order to calculate the remaining two elastic constants. So just to summarise, in this video we've introduced our four elastic constants, elastic modulus, modulus of rigidity, bulk modulus and Poisson's ratio, and we've discussed briefly the equations that connect these together. In the next video we're going to look at how we apply these equations to determine the unknown elastic constants for a given material.